basically do this with asterisk yourself? You could. Um, the yeah. telephone company regulations prevent you from putting switching equipment in other people's central offices. So you would have to get a channel bank at their central office. You'd have to be gain CLEC status. You would have to negotiate interconnect agreements. You would have to pay to co-locate your uh, equipment there and then run T1s back to your switching center where so God help the, me hope you're not running just asterisk or at least more than one of them. Well, on top of yeah. that, for the love of God, <laughs> you'd also have to be running SS7 as well as part of the interconnect, which I believe it's kind of, I suppose it's kind of an SS7 as of the last one. Yeah, there, there are projects for that. Yeah. And if everybody doesn't know, um, SS7 is basically how phones which just talk to each other between central offices. It's the mother of all signaling protocols. <laughs> there are parts of it that are used for simply saying, um, trunk one, trunk one uh, line four, there is a call coming in from this number. We're trying to get this number. Uh, can you complete the circuit? And it says yes. And then you, it starts ringing the end party, and it comes back saying, I'm ringing the end party. And then the call pi either picks up, or it comes back and says, uh, the user is busy. Or it will say, um, you know, the user has picked up, open a voice path, supervise. Just begins, begin billing. Um, and uh, there's also where you get the, you'll notice at a certain point in time in the late 80s, the phone company started offering automatic callback where it would just continuously call a number and it would ring your phone when they were no longer busy. What would it do? Just kind of and what it actually does, it um, it every 30 it seconds, it would try to open a voice path over SS7 to the other switch. And it would look and see if it got a busy response code. If it didn't, it would say, hold on a minute, ring you. And then it would say, okay, complete the call while yours is ringing and hope that you would pick up around the same time. But, but if, yeah, as Paul's saying, don't, dear God, don't do this with asterisk, though for all I know, there's probably some c -luck out there that is doing this. Right. Um, you have to, if, if you're running that kind of interconnect, you're running that kind of truck, you have to stay up 24-7. Going down is not an option. You can actually get failover for asterisk? I mean... Well, I mean, that's the thing. You'd have to set up multiple redundant asterisk right. systems it's, it's and not trust. It's asterisk that we have the problem with. It's that you, if you drop an SS7, like, you can actually affect the phone system in a negative way because the other thing that exists, not only is it trying to open signaling paths, and there are timeouts. So, you know, they're just squirting over the path. Hey, can I get a path? Can I get a path? Can I get a path? And they're waiting for you to reply. Um, and it's possible if you receive a high call volume to um, cause really bad things to happen at the other end of that SS7 link if you don't answer. Uh, the other thing that you'll find too is that it's also used for something called TCAP, which is database lookups. So where you're trying to look up, say, um, I need the caller ID data for this user, or is, does this user have collect call block? Does this user, can I third party bill this user? Um, you know, so or even so local, no, local number, no, number portability is another one. Is Do you actually have this phone number? Because I think you do, or does somebody else actually have this? And I need to complete the call in another direction. Um, what I was going to say, though, about Asterisk in terms of being your own phone company. Um, right now, we're looking at Asterisk to do some tenant stuff, because we have tenants in our office building. So if they're bringing their own lines in on your PRIs or on analog fronts or whatever, then you know you can use it. If somebody's talking to me last night, I didn't catch your name about sub billing with asterisk to your tenants off the lines that are coming, your DIDs that are coming into your, your office. So you're not exactly being a CLAC, you're just kind of providing services to your tenants. So that is one niche use of people, third parties outside of yourself being used in an application like that. So we're potentially looking at, instead of adding a third cabinet to our option 61 Nortel, which is not a small space investment, um, doing a bunch of things <coughs> using Asterisk with some of the sub building software um, that's out there to to provide those services. Okay, as far as uh, as far as being your own telco, I want to go back to that idea. Rather than going the official route and putting the equipment in the central offices and negotiating with the phone companies and, and doing that, you know, you can take the total guerrilla approach and just say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna all run our own equipment and do our own links and kind of run independent of it. And uh, you should go to personaltelco.net. And there's, uh, there's an interesting project. It's, it's kind of like, it. I learned about it in the same time period where I learned about Seattle Wireless. It's a, a very similar sort of idea. People are, are trying to create their own infrastructure using the unlicensed radio spectrum. And, and yeah, you know, 
Uh, yeah, they're, they're doing all sorts of things. Um, I haven't been to their site in a very long time. I don't know what they're up to lately, but I'm going to go find out. You know, Nate, I do have one, one bitch about uh, if you're in the cell industry. Oh, what please. Is up, what, what is up with, you know, it's like you, you can't get a cell phone anymore that's got any decent, I mean, the compression in the vocoders are using absolutely blows. Uh, I mean, I've literally had guys use Skype on their, you know, their, their, their cell phones and get a better sounding the, connection sure. than their standard, you know, voice. Because the, the, the vocoder issue is, is channel capacity. They, they simply, they don't have the spectrum, they don't have the tower density they need to handle the call volumes. Um, I mean, analog even sounded better. Oh yeah, analog sounded better and, and it would hold like 20 calls per cell, you know, or something something ridiculously low like that. Well, you get an 8 to 1, you know, vocoder, a 12 to 1 vocoder, you're, you're looking at a lot more, you know, customer billable minutes per tower. People really loathe busy signals. And or or you know, system not available retry later, um, and you know they, they do anything they can to avoid that. What they should be doing is putting up more smaller towers so they, they have the density. The, the the deal here for anyone who, who hasn't done a lot of cellular uh, research or reading is is called geographic frequency reuse or spatial frequency reuse. The very first um, the very first mobile phone systems you had like one site in the middle of town and and your mobile unit bolted to your trunk was blasting out 50 watts. And, and they had you know, a certain, like, let's say, a handful of channels they could use. And so that meant you had a handful of, of phone calls that could be in progress in the entire metropolitan area. A handful minus one, there's a signaling channel. Yeah, and the, the signaling <laughs> channel actually. the entire challenge for signaling? Yeah, yep. the, the signaling channel was, was also known as a calling channel because someone would actually pick up like the microphone and say, you know, unit three, you have a call. Um, well, and, and on top of that, you, you also have to keep in mind that this is, these were more like land mobile radios with phone patches. Exactly. And, and it was possible they, to hear other people's calls. And, and so then the, the cellular system... Well, yeah. these were transistor units that were mounted in trucks. The, the, the big deal with cellular was that now we've got all these little base station sites all around the area, and somebody who's on this cell is taking up this radio channel. And so for the couple neighboring cells, that radio channel's got somebody on it. But when you get to the other side of town, you can have another call on that same radio channel. And you've got geographic frequency reuse. And, and the denser you can pack these cells, the less power you can run, the smaller space you, you splatter that channel over, the more total concurrent calls you can have in the same amount of spectrum. So instead of putting up a constant 2 and 300 foot tower, why don't they just go off like a white box concept and only have like 60 foot towers? Not in my backyard. Five or ten. Talk, talk to your homeowners association, talk to your local city government and say, my cell phone quality sucks because my company has to run a, a 37 to 1 vocoder and it's because they don't have the ability to put as many towers as they need up. And that's, that's simply where it is. Well, I, I, don't, I don't mean to defend the industry, but that's its business. Well, and at the same time, it depends on where in the industry. Because one thing that's happened, at least in the Detroit area, um, you'll be driving around to see a great pod on top of a telephone pole, because the telephone pole's already there. Um, I know next time... It's the white pods on the... Uh, other side, on the white shape, like, that's ricochet. Um, <laughs> don't even go there. We're, we're down to five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, they are starting to do that in areas that geographically make sense. Because I've seen these, I haven't been able to identify all of them, because they're usually in beige NEMA enclosures with no identifying stickers. Darn it. Mm -hmm. um, they're connected via either T1 or fiber. Um, I have seen one some with Nextel stickers on them, but they're using the existing infrastructure. Um, and again, I can't—I don't know all the carriers that are doing this. I only saw one Nextel sticker on one box, and I, it may have been there by accident. We need, um, we need pictures. I, I, well, had I known I was doing this, I might have gotten pictures. Um, but they are starting to do that. They are starting to do the microcellular level on existing phone infrastructure. Um, the telcos are pulling an immense amount of fiber. These are 72 strand cables. They're not using all of them. They will, they, you can buy down fiber from the telcos. They're just not really advertising it yet. And so there is, there's multiple wavelengths per fiber, so you can have several colors on all 72 strands. So if you're driving around and you start seeing things, if you start seeing little gray pods or even um, their white antennas with big beige boxes underneath them, those are cell sites. And I'm starting to see a lot more of those now. That's a fairly, that's like within the last six months though. Yeah, I've seen a couple. Um, there's, there's a website you should check out. I think it's called wirelessadvisor.com. They have a, a section of their forums called the Tower Hunting Team. And they do 
they, they love the cell phones that are disguised as trees and clock towers and stuff. But in general, they just they collect pictures of different types of cellular equipment. And so if, if you start seeing these things out there and you don't know what they are, take a picture, post it up on Tower Hunting Team with as much data as you can gather, and let the people comment, because there's some, there's some really knowledgeable people on those forums. I really like the West Bloomfield tactic where they had the 200 foot tall T-Mobile pine tree. No, it's Sprint. Oh, it's it, T-Mobile's not Oh, well, that's right there. Um, yeah, basically, the city of West Bloomfield, said, uh, Michigan said, you can't build a cell tower that, that's, that's that high. You have to disguise it. So they put pine, large transparent fake pine branches around a, was it a 200 foot tower? <laughs> it's a 200 foot tower. It sticks out like a sequoia, which by the way, don't grow in Michigan for anybody who's not from Michigan. Um, and so it's even more obvious than anything else. Trees, 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 tower, trees, trees, trees. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we've we got one, five minutes? No. Okay. Yeah, well, you do have five minutes now, but. Okay. Uh, he, he has a question, though. I just wanted to say that uh, my family has a lemon field, and next to it there's a walnut field. It was recently cleared out, and within two days or so it seemed, a huge palm tree sprouted up. This is Southern California, and it's perfectly straight, and then it has leaves at the top. <laughs> and it's a cell site. And we were like, oh. we didn't see that two days ago. Um, <laughs> sudden pine tree growth for the yeah. people in the video. Uh, somebody palm tree, tree rather. Right. Somebody, missed right. a, somebody missed a zoning meeting. <laughs> We've got one of those pine trees in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, too, right off 287. Take, take pictures. There, there are thousands of these, these things out there. Um, Andrew and a couple of other companies make these disguises. It's like Andrew has been making microwave equipment and antennas and towers for decades. And, and now they're making pine needles um, and, and things like that because yeah, what, the, what the companies are buying. Um, there are so many varieties of these disguised uh, towers, it's hilarious. Yeah, the biggest oh, problem oh. everything has is not in my backyard. No one ever wants this stuff to be in their neighborhood, but they want their cell phone to work perfectly. I've noticed that people with Wi Fi, they're their own worst enemy. It's like, oh, you know, especially in rural areas, you know, people come to me all the time, how come I can't get cable DSL? I'm like, well, oh, we can put a 200 foot tower up there. Oh, I don't want that in my backyard. Well, how bad do you want service? Yeah, too bad. <laughs> you know, that's so how it like works. You're your own damn worst enemy. Here. Yeah, I like the rich, pay, the rich towns who can afford to make like a wireless infrastructure. They're all like, "Well, I don't want these unsightly boxes hanging off my uh, light poles." There's no way. The, those look like shoe boxes. They're awful. And it's like, well, fine. Don't have wireless on your city. What 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 gets me is that you know back when all these these electric utility poles were put up, nobody cared, and we've we've gotten so used to them. We don't even see them. And you know, some neighborhoods are putting their utilities on the ground, but most of the time you drive down the road, there's this huge forest of wires. And then people are like, one more tower. Oh, no, we can't have one more tower. Yeah, we get you get used to it. The towers are pretty big paint with that kind of light absorbing gray paint. So they tend to, no matter what the sky color, they tend to blend in. Yeah, the kind of sky bluish. Yeah, you can, you can do that. It doesn't work that well. Or maybe it's just me. I, I see towers everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Because we're, we're apparently time short. Has anybody got one, one more question? Or? Well, you guys still have like three minutes to. Oh, okay. Two short questions or a long one. What about cell phones? Well, what about caller ID? And why, why, why the hell that caller ID with name does not come with cell phones for some odd reason? Why is there an interoperability? There's, there's no capability in the uh, protocol for them to send a name, and where there is, the phones themselves or the switches don't enter. Is that regulatory? Or no. just when, 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 the, when the cell phone protocols were written, nobody wanted caller ID with name on their phones. Yeah. When they were originally written, no one wanted caller ID. Then they found a way to send caller ID. Um, I, I think in the analog spec, there may actually be a caller ID with name set that you can do, but nobody ever supported it. Um, and just like you know, the second NAM, there, there's just so many things that weren't just like any other telco thing. There's so many features that they don't actually support because uh, they either didn't know we're there, or um, they can't convince management that this is a good idea. Or Pester, build a box of stuff in the data stream. Uh, uh, Pester, Pester your provider. That'll that'll get that box built. Yeah, it'll, it ultimately comes down to also what flash you're going to put on the phone, what 
what infrastructure they're going to do. I mean, if you ever really want an interesting read, go download the GSM spec sometime. It's about this thick if you print it, or even more. If, if you, you go through that, and there are so many features in the 